Now, what we here have here is a quote from the Nobel Prize winner from 1937, that what drives life is a little current kept up by sunshine. But what this is a simple way of saying is that without photosynthesis, there's no life on Earth. And what is photosynthesis at its basis? It's the ability of a plant to take CO2, the gas carbon dioxide, mix it with water, and through an enzymatic reaction, he'll yield, the plant can yield oxygen, which we need to breathe, and sugar, sucrose, which is the basis of everything we eat. So let's go back now, though, early to the evolution. Scientists will tell us that the Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago. Now think about this for a second. I've told you this is a fact. The Earth was born four and a half billion years ago. How do they know that? What are the evidence that supports that? I'm not going to tell you the whole story of how the Earth was formed. For that, I want you to go online and you can study this yourself and come up with some of the theories that how the Earth was formed, and you can put that onto the forum. But let's talk about life. Once the Earth was formed, how was life formed? What hypotheses or what theories have you heard about? Okay, again, please just write it here and on the screen. How do you think life was formed? Now, there are a couple of different theories that have gone around. You know, and we're not going to talk about religion. Um, why are we not going to talk about religion? Well, because there's no experiment that you can do to prove it or to disprove it. So while that might be your opinion, we're not going to deal with that here in the course. There are some other theories. For example, aliens came in and colonized the Earth. Again, this is a problem that there's no real experiment that you can do. Now, there are some, uh, some theories that you might know that there was that life formed spontaneously through, through the primordial soup that was available or that was present in the early Earth. So what experiments could be done to check this? Well, this was actually the hypothesis of Stanley Miller, who was then a young scientist in the early 50s at the, at the University of California, at the California Institute of Technology. And his hypothesis, together with his mentor, was that the early conditions of Earth contained the chemicals and the energy necessary for life to form, or for at least organic molecules, to form spontaneously. So what was the experiment they did? They took ammonia gas, they took heat, they took hydrogen, and they took water and electricity, and mixed them together, and then checked what they found in the water. And lo and behold, they found organic molecules, including nucleic acids. Now, does this experiment prove that that's how life formed? Well, what does it prove? It proves that under these conditions, organic molecules can be found. But there's a big assumption here. And the assumption is that this was the condition. These were the conditions early on Earth's development. The problem is that with time, geologists have come to the conclusion that the conditions were slightly different. So what type of experiment could be formed? Well, you could then change the conditions to what geologists actually think were. And what we now know is that in almost every type of experiment that people have done to repeat Miller's experiments, we do get organic molecules formed. Now, this doesn't prove that this is how life was formed on the early Earth, but it does actually give a lot of um, uh, evidence to support the hypothesis that there was, uh, could happen spontaneously. So once we have these organic molecules swimming around in the oceans, they could perhaps self-associate to form the early cells. Now I want to ask the question, if we have early cells being formed, what type of cells were they? And there's two terms I want to talk about here. One is called heterotrophy. This is the type of life that, that survives by eating, by finding and absorbing food. And the other term is autotrophy. These are organisms that can make their own food, make their own energy. Heterotrophies are consumers. Autotrophic organisms are producers. So what do you think were the first cells that evolved on Earth? Consumers or producers? What experiment can be done to differentiate between these two, or what would be the evidence that would support the two? So most of you 
answered autotrophs, that it seems logical to you that the first organisms were those that made their own food. But actually, the first organisms on the planet were the heterotrophic bacteria, the ones that absorb their food, their consumers. How do we know that? We know that from the fossil record. We can find in fossils, fossils of bacteria. And when we look at these fossils, these bacteria, the oldest ones that we find, resemble bacteria, modern bacteria that are also consumers, that are heterotrophic bacteria. The first billion years of life on Earth was only heterotrophic bacteria that were floating in the ocean. And only about two and a half billion years ago, the first photosynthetic, the first autotrophic bacteria appear, at least in the fossil record. From a philosoph philosophical point of view, we can understand this, that heterotrophy is simpler than autotrophy. It's much easier to eat than it is to produce your own food. So the first organisms that evolved were the simple consumers, the heterotrophic bacteria, and only later do we see the evolution of the more complex autotrophic bacteria. Let's take a closer look at the history of the Earth together with the evolution of life. So the heterotrophs, which evolved quite early in the history of the Earth, had the world to themselves for the first billion years. It was only about two and a half billion years later, according to the fossil record, that autotrophic bacteria began to appear. So these autotrophic and heterotrophic bacteria coexisted in the ocean, with the autotrophs making food and the heterotrophic bacteria eating the food. Unicellular eukaryotic cells evolved about one billion years later. Eukaryotic cells are the type of cells that our bodies are made up of and the bodies of all animals and all plants. But multicellular organisms only started to appear about one billion years ago. Now, all of these organisms evolved in the oceans as the oceans provided an environment that was both nourishing and protective. The land was originally uninhabitable, and it was uninhabitable because it was dry, had extreme temperatures, and it was exposed to harmful UV radiation. So here we see another huge effect of plants on the evolution of the Earth. Because through photosynthesis, these autotrophic bacteria, the photosynthetic multicellular organisms, were making and releasing oxygen. The release of oxygen into the atmosphere eventually led to the formation of the ozone. And once there was an ozone to protect the land from harmful UV radiation, the dry parts of the Earth could be colonized by plants and animals, and this happened about 500 million years ago. One of the ways we see this happening is through the huge reduction in the amount of CO2 that was present in the atmosphere at this time. As plants left the oceans and colonized land, more and more photosynthesis led to a reduction in CO2 levels and an increase in atmospheric oxygen. But as plants left the oceans and got onto dry land, how did this affect plant evolution? What were the pressures in evolution that plants felt on the land that they didn't have in the oceans. Take a second to think about this and write it down here in the forum. What are the, the pressures? What are the, the different problems a plant would have on the land that it doesn't have in the ocean? One of the most obvious problems is a problem of water. A plant a photosynthetic organism in the ocean doesn't have any problem of absorbing water and having it in all of its cells. But once you're on the land, you have to find some way of absorbing water and transferring that water to all the other parts of the plant. An organism in the ocean can float around, whereas an organism on dry land has to be rooted. It has to be find a way of holding itself against all of the pressures of wind, of sun, of cold. And it is these pressures which led to the development of plants as we know. How a plant learned, and I'll use that as air quotes, to understand its environment, how it can sense its environment. And while there are various forms of higher plants, ranging from the first earlier organisms all the way up to the modern ones, in this class we're only going to be dealing with higher plants, which we call angiosperms. And so in next week's lecture, we're going to be looking at angiosperms, the higher plants, and asking, what does it see? How do these plants know where the light is? And is there anything special about the light 
that gives information to the plants. See you next week.